All right. Good morning, everyone. I apologize. My voice is a little bit uh, raspy. I'm losing it. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining us and welcome to the third annual California College Affordability Summit. My name is Cherry Cunningham and I will be your moderator tech for this breakout. I'm here to provide virtual support for both you and the presenter during the presentation. All attendees have been muted, so we ask that you put your questions in the chat or at the end of the presentation. If time allows, uh, you can raise your hand on the icon and we will be happy to unmute you to ask your question. Should you have any questions or need assistance with the Zoom interface, you can use the chat icon on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, search for my name and send a direct private message to me. I will do my best to provide assistance to resolve your concern. It is my pleasure to now introduce you, your presenter for this session titled, You Talking to Me, Developing a Marketing Outreach and Communications Campaign to Address Student Financial Aid Completion, presented by Michael Lemus, Program Outreach and Marketing Manager for the California Student Aid Commission. Thank you so much, and here he is. All right. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, and hello, everyone. I hope that you all are enjoying the California College Affordability Summit. We've been planning this for a while, so I'm glad that it's finally here, and it's our last day, so I'm hoping that you're enjoying so as uh, was already introduced, my name is Michael Lemus and I'm the Program Outreach and Marketing Manager at the California Student Aid Commission. We're actually a pretty brand new unit, I would say within the last year. So we're the Program Outreach and Marketing Unit for folks that are not as familiar with what we do. I did wanna go ahead and just start off there. Um, we are a resource for you all. We're a resource for commission staff, but we're also a resource for our community partners as we expand on outreach and marketing initiatives for financial aid and how we actually reach out to students, which is what I'm gonna be talking about pretty much the entirety of this presentation, is how we utilize different tools, launch campaigns, and how we work across the community, including you all, to really effectively reach our students here in the state of California. So why don't we go ahead and jump in? I believe that we're gonna go ahead and start sharing the screen. Um, so we'll go ahead and get that going first. But in the meantime, let me go ahead and actually see, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, in the meantime, I would love to go ahead and just see where folks are joining us from. So if you want to put your city in the chat, I'd love to go ahead and just get a better understanding of where folks are coming from. I know we have people from all over the place, all over California. Let's see Anaheim, Palm Springs, San Diego, Bakersfield, Sonoma, Eureka, LA. So all over the place. Definitely excited to have you all here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and actually jump into presenter mode. So Cherry, if you can go ahead and get that going. I think right now it's on, it's showing all the slides. Cool, so I'm seeing more cities roll through San Diego. So we're gonna go ahead and get this on presenter mode. There we go, thank you. All right, so just to start off with a brief introduction for myself. So as I said, I am the Program Outreach and Marketing Manager here at the California Student Aid Commission, but Prior to joining the commission, I actually spent seven plus years, give or take, in the higher education space. So I worked at the CSU, the UC, the California Community College System. That is my background. So my uh, uh, master's degree is actually in higher education from Cal State Fullerton. I also went to Cal Poly Pomona for my psychology degree in undergrad. Um, so I am very, very passionate about education, educational equity, access to a post-secondary education. So I'm super excited to be here. Started off at the commission in the fall of 2019 as a trainer, then I was the communications manager, and then most recently I'm now in this position leading our outreach and marketing unit. So if we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So we're going to start off with a question here. So why is an effective outreach marketing and communication strategy needed? What I would love to go ahead and see in the chat, even if you want to just throw in a couple of words, statements, is just to get an understanding from you all. Um, you obviously chose to come to the session for a reason, so I would love to get an understanding, even if it's just a few words, on why you think we need an effective outreach marketing communication strategy before I go into the next slide, which is to touch on some core reasons. But again, would love to hear from you all. And throughout the presentation, you'll note that I'll really want to engage with you all. We're a, we're a small audience here in terms of uh, the group, so I'm really hoping to go ahead and just continue to just gauge with you all what it is that you all are also hoping to gain from developing your own strategies. So reach a large student population, building great programs, families needing to understand the steps of the financial aid. Absolutely, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, better understanding where to get help. Yes, positioning ourselves as a resource is gonna be super critical. Without it, students and parents will not know what services are available. Yes, 
creating a school-wide culture? Absolutely, great responses. So why don't we jump on to the next slide and we'll continue to read through those responses there. So what does it allow for? It allows for an exchange of information. So we're obviously wanting to go ahead and get out information in, in this case to our students, but also to their families, to community partners, it really will take uh, you know, an all hands on deck approach to successfully implement AB 469 because it's such a large undertaking, especially on you all, the folks on the ground helping us to go ahead and make sure that this actually happens. We're really gonna need to go ahead and develop these campaigns and be as clear and concise as possible for our audience. And so developing this type of strategy allows for an exchange of information between us as a resource and of course our audience, whether that be students, parents, community members. It also allows for clear and direct communication. So oftentimes we hear students are saying, we get these long emails or we're just inundated with so many different communications. How do we also look at our communications on an ongoing basis to actually get more clear and direct? Sometimes it literally will be a sentence or two. Sometimes it's going to be developing in a different way. Maybe sometimes we're going to use email and then combine that with another different form of outreach. We really want to go ahead and also look at how we can condense some of that information. Because this day and age, if we're talking about high school students, as I'm sure you all are aware of, they're not reading emails as much. And we definitely see that in the analytics. And there's just the open rates for those emails are really low. And so we're trying to find better ways to go ahead and communicate with them. But if we are sending those emails, how we can also condense what we've used to send in the past when it used to be longer emails, and then also position ourselves as a resource. So this next point here, positioning ourselves as a resource is super important because we want people that are engaging with us at the commission, at the schools, at community-based organizations, to have our audience really see us as a good resource that's gonna allow them to understand the financial aid process, but also to go ahead and do that next point, relationship building. A lot of folks, you know, we're at a state agency, so sometimes people are scared to go ahead and engage with a state agency or they just don't trust you know, government spaces. We want to go ahead and continue to position ourselves as a space that is doing that community and relationship building and to position ourselves as a resource that we are actually here to help. And then the other piece is to develop brand consistency. So just out of curiosity for folks that have been engaging with CSAC, um, even over the last two years, have you noticed that we went through a rebrand? You could put yes, no, whatever you can put. Yeah, so I've seen some, great. Okay, that makes me so excited. Um, so two years ago, we went through a rebrand and we changed our logos, we changed our colors. It was a really big, big change. Um, and over the last few years, we've been transforming our brand to really speak to the consistency, not just in the aesthetics, but also the messaging and how we go about communicating with our audience. That brand consistency is so important. And we have people on the team that really just focus their efforts on that, making sure that our brand is consistent down to the colors, to the fonts, to the messages, and then really continuing to refine that. And last but not least, it allows for creativity for us to really think beyond what our communication even used to look like prior to the pandemic and what it looks like now. So just some brief points here. So we're going to jump into the next slide. All right. So who are our students? And then, yes, those CalSUP logos definitely got a rebrand as well. Um, so who are our, our students here in California? We're going to jump into the next slide to just do a quick summary of that. This is, of course, not encompassing of every single student here in California, but I do want to go ahead and take note that here at CSAC and in our conversations with our partners, we're really thinking about the diversity and the inclusion factor of what that actually looks like when we're reaching out to students across California. We know that our students are coming from different ethnic and cultural groups. We have undocumented students. This is something that I really want to go ahead and touch on is that as folks are talking about FAFSA, please always remember and it's, you know, it's part of that culture shift because sometimes people just legitimately sometimes just forget to mention it. But that language is so important to make sure that we bring up the California Dream Act application because we're one of the few states in the entire country that actually even offers financial aid at the statewide level for our undocumented students. So when you say FAFSA, we say CADA, just remembering that over and over again. We have students, of course, that are coming that have different disabilities, whether that be mental, physical or hidden disabilities that can impact how they actually navigate education, how they access a, you know, a form of post-secondary education. We have, of course, students that fall within the LGBTQIA population. And last but not least, I really wanna hone in on this as well. You know, As we discuss outreach, marketing, alternative and continuation schools are 
so important. And unfortunately, sometimes those students are forgotten or the tactics or the, you know, the mechanisms of reaching out may need to look a little bit different, but that's where we really talk about equity and making sure that when we're actually doing any sort of outreach or marketing, that we're looking at it through an equitable framework and not just assuming that we're going to go ahead and reach all students in the same ways, because ultimately they want to go ahead and be communicated in different ways. Um, that includes technology, but it also includes messaging points and then making sure that our marketing also reflects that, you know, who's on our flyers, who, you know, shows up to our events. All those things are things that we just need to be conscious of. But we know that you all are also doing some really incredible work. We see it on social media. We see it across your events. And we know that, again, the student population here in California is extremely diverse, which means we need to match that. And if we go on to the next slide. All right. So outreach, marketing, and communications techniques. So I did want to just do a high-level overview of some of the things that we've been doing, um, but also to get an understanding of things that you've been doing. So in the chat, as I go through these, please feel free to go ahead and just mention some things, whether you're doing um, some of the things that are mentioned here or some other creative things that are not mentioned here. So we've done a lot, especially this past year and a half, as we have realized that students are just not checking their email as much. So we realized, OK, well, if they're not checking their email, how else can we go about communicating with them? It's really complex, especially during a pandemic, as you probably have noticed to reach these students. And we know that a couple of things have actually worked. So print media, which is really interesting because prior to the pandemic, we were like, hmm, do we need as much print material as we needed uh, before? And then at first we're like, maybe not, you know, we're seeing more and more students in a digital platform. But as the pandemic, especially year two of the pandemic hit, students were also, at least from what we were hearing, getting really inundated with digital resources being thrown at them. And so it was also trying to find, you know, that middle, that sweet space in the middle where it's like, okay, if they're not checking those emails as much, what else can we do? So print media such as flyers and postcards are actually still extremely effective. Um, later on, I'll actually be talking about what we did with postcards, but they still work. They still work and we've actually seen quite a bit of success. And so if you have the opportunity to be able to still print out materials, even postcards, mail things to these students and their families, that's actually still very successful. Um, at CSAC, we actually just launched a texting platform. So another thing that we're trying to do is text these students and then eventually even text parents and different uh, folks, even maybe you all as our partners to go ahead and get out some of that messaging. According to some of the data out there with texting, there's over a 90% open rate when it comes to a text message versus for actual emails, it tends to be about 25 to 30%. So we're recognizing how do we go ahead and get these students to opt into our texting platform and then use that as one of the main modes of communication. So I'll go over a case study later on to talk about how we did that with postcards. Now, content creation, we also launched a podcast. It's called Financial Paid. So feel free to go ahead and take a listen when you want. Um, but we're on streaming services as well as YouTube. But we wanted to get more creative in the sense of how we can actually talk to our students through different modes where they can physically see us, whether it be through a video like a vodcast or hear us on their favorite streaming services. Social media has been critical to how we have been able to go ahead and move forward in our messaging. We have definitely grown our numbers, our following, and we have students actually now reaching out to us directly about their questions on social media. So that's been a big game changer for us in addition to, of course, pairing it with the rebrand. In-person outreach events, that's definitely been increasing a little bit more in the last couple of months and will, of course, continue to increase as we go into the fall but we are ramping up on our in-person outreach events such as college fairs. We're going to, um, for example, we're at the Black College Expo in February. Um, and then we did a couple of other events in March and a few that we're actually having in the, in the summer. So we're definitely getting more used to, again, just that reintegration into the in-person outreach events. Phone banking, believe it or not, that's actually still pretty successful, especially as we reach you all, our partners. So we've been calling the schools directly to talk about FAFSA-cated um, and their rates and how we can actually support schools because we folks have been really inundated during this pandemic. We know there are so many challenges and to be thrown, you know, another set of requirements, another thing that you need to do. We understand it's a lot. So for us, it's how do we work with our partners? And sometimes that's going to be making phone calls to you all and, hey, this is a way that we can go ahead and work with you all. Are you open to that? And having more of those partnership conversations and then really going about it through that community approach. Last but not least, I've been mentioning this for a while, but memos, alerts, emails, newsletters, 
they can still be successful. Um, how many of you are familiar with MailChimp or something similar to that to send out any sort of email communications? I ask that because when it comes to emails, what we've also seen is that when we've gotten more creative with our platforms, we use MailChimp, for example, that's, we've seen some more success in terms of the open rates because we can add in and be really creative with our subject lines. We can add in images, GIFs, memes, all sorts of different things into those emails to hopefully make it a little bit more uh, dynamic and engaging for these students instead of them having to read through a whole bunch of text. So oftentimes what we've also realized is that if you have more than one or two call to action items for students, something's gonna get missed most likely. And so we've also realized that if we're trying to get them to do something, it's most likely gonna be one call to action. And I'm seeing a couple of different, uh, different platforms that people are using, so S'more and then Regroup. Um, just again, being clear, concise, if it's one call to action, that's probably the best, and then having a separate communication for something else. But of course, you all have many different tactics that you can use there. But just a high level overview there, if we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so this one is really big. So inclusive language. I mentioned this earlier, California is of course extremely diverse. And so one of the things that we worked actually with a marketing agency on is the development of materials in a variety of different languages. We're gonna continue to expand beyond of course what you just see in the screen here, but that's a big priority for us, um, not just for the students, but especially for the parents. The parents, for example, if there's any sort of um, language barriers. We want to make sure, you know, ideally we would love to see these things printed and in different spaces so that the students and the parents can have those conversations. And if language is a barrier, that that not be a big concern moving forward because we realize that our content needs to be as inclusive as possible. And that's going to be, of course, using different languages. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with our CSAC website, but one of the really cool things that some people don't know about is that there's a live language translation tool at the very high top, I think it's at the top right of our website, where students, parents, whoever's engaging with the website can literally click on a different languages. I, I believe there's over 20. So just something to note there, language is really, really important. We can go on to the next slide. Okay, Cash for College, just out of curiosity, in the chat, how many people are familiar with the Cash for College program here at CSAC? Whether you've hosted workshops, worked with CSAC on them, I'm seeing lots of yeses, great. Um, for folks that are not familiar with what Cash for College is, I do wanna go ahead and just share just a quick overview. So Cash for College, prior to the pandemic, was really in-person workshops where we at CSAC and also our school partners um, and sometimes it's just our school partners that are hosting them, um, as well as community-based organizations, host actual workshops to help students and their parents complete the financial aid application, whether it be the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application live. They're free. Oftentimes there is like incentives to go ahead and get the students there, of course, but it's a really huge help because we literally help these students complete their applications or at least get started. That was prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic at CSAC, we realized, hey, why don't we actually host statewide webinars, especially at the point where there really weren't many in-person events. We started to have statewide webinars where we could reach students and their parents, families across California. And we partnered with different organizations. We partnered with government officials to go ahead and host these statewide webinars. Moving into the fall, we're still gonna go ahead and have those statewide webinars at the CSAC level. And local workshops are of course ramping up again in person. So there's gonna be a combination of those moving forward, but we really wanna use this as an opportunity to also work with other partners to, again, speak to that community collaboration. So you're still gonna to continue to see that from CSAC. Those statewide webinars are not going away. The last piece of the Cash for College program, and this was an expansion during the pandemic that we're also keeping is train the trainer. Out of curiosity there, and this one may be a little bit less, but who is familiar with train the trainer? If you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat. And totally okay if you're not, but if you are, great. Um, Train the Trainer was built in the pandemic and basically it's a certification program. So it's also a cool opportunity for professional development. Train the Trainer is a program that is available to community-based organizations to go ahead and go through a quick two-hour workshop. You get trained by actual CSAC trainers, folks from our staff, and you get certified to be able to host your own Cash for College workshop. We'll talk about a little bit more about train the trainer and how many folks we have actually gotten the opportunity to train in a bit, but 
that's a huge opportunity. So if you know of anyone that wants to go ahead and get that official certification from CSAC, please send them our way. Train the trainer is a great opportunity for that. So if we can go on to the next slide here. So train the trainer, we're gonna go through an overview. So we're gonna jump into the next slide so I can give you uh, just an explanation of where we've been at here. So as far as train the trainer goes, We've actually had, uh, this is looking at our last financial aid cycle. So looking at the beginning of October through March 2nd, that state priority deadline, we had over seven sessions where we've actually trained over 450 participants. So that was just in that cycle alone. We have actually had trained the trainer for about a year and a half now. So we've trained, if I'm not mistaken, a little over a thousand people. But the really cool thing is just in that cycle between October and March, we have actually trained over 197 organizations. You can see in the map that we've had over 37 out of the 58 counties reached. We want to reach all the counties, so there's still some work to do, but that's still pretty impressive for the first, uh, just within that cycle alone. And over 84% of our participants rated the training as excellent or above average, meaning that folks are getting some really good information out of it. Um, and over 94% of our participants rated the trainers. So we actually have actual trainers, many of which you've actually interacted with, for example, John Waldrop, who you saw at the opening of our session today. Um, as excellent or above average. So we have some really good financial aid pros that are ready to go ahead and train you all to go ahead and get you that information. So if we go on to the next slide. So some notable partners that we've gotten a chance to work with. The cool thing as we do this is that as we partner with folks like you all, sometimes you all will give us partners and say, hey, have you considered working with these people? Hey, you should look into this group. Um, I really want to give a shout out to, of course, all the organizations listed on this screen, but some of the cool things that we've been able to do is partner with different community-based organizations to, for example, attend the Black College Expo. So we went to LA, we went to Oakland, we went to San Diego. Uh, we've worked with Immigrants Rising, have done some really great work for the undocumented student population. We work with the community college system, the regional coordinating organizations, our Cal SOAPs, and as you can see, many government officials. Um, we've worked with different panels, different groups out in the community. We realize, especially as we go into the fall with AB 469 implementation, that although the requirement is really on the schools, we're going to continue to work across the community to go ahead and make sure that the community knows why this is so important. Um, and really involve them in the process as well, because that way we can get some more reinforcement. But hey, you know, a student goes through so many different places. And so if they hear more and more about financial aid being important, it'll be better for us too. Uh, TRIO, yes, absolutely. The EAOP programs, there's so many folks out there. AVID, I mean, there's so many folks that are doing some wonderful work. Um, and we want to continue to uplift, you know, those voices and make sure that we're working closer and closer together. So just some notable partners there. You see Senator Alex Padilla, I mean, his, his picture, he actually recorded some PSAs for us. He was involved um, in our Steps to College event that the Mexican consulates hosted. So a lot of really great opportunities that we got a chance to take advantage of this past year. So we go on to the next slide. So scholarships, this is new. Um, so CSAC is not the actual ones giving the scholarships. We were actually able to go ahead and get some funding from another organization to fund scholarships this past year. It was more of a pilot run um, but I know many of you, we've definitely heard out from the ground uh, that there is um, a lot of opportunities for scholarships that sometimes you all also provide. We tried this out and it actually had a lot of success here. So in April, we we're able to go ahead and, and this is what we're working on right now. We're working on awarding some students or letting them know that they actually got scholarships. So basically in the middle of January to late January, we started announcing the fact that we had scholarships available for students if they attended our Cash for College webinars or workshops. And we wanted to see if that would actually increase our registration for those, but also if it would increase the survey submission. So Cash for College at the end of those workshops, there's always a survey. Um, and during the pandemic, there was some struggle in getting students to you know, really fill those out. And what we were able to do is actually put in the scholarship verbiage into our marketing materials, but also have it be part of how they can actually um, basically be entered for a scholarship. So they needed to go ahead and go through the workshop, fill out the survey, and then also complete a FAFSA or California Dream Act applications. So we're able to track all that information. So in April, um, we're actually going to be focusing those scholarship efforts on the Black Focus workshops that we had. We also had an API workshop back in March um, and the Steps to College. So those are more, you know, ethnic cultural based. We're also doing a lot of um, 
marketing and outreach for our community college students. September 2nd is actually the deadline for them to still be able to apply or I should say qualify for a Cal Grant. So even though March 2nd is the big push, if you all have any students out there that are still wondering, hey, maybe I should go to a community college, they still have time to actually qualify for a Cal Grant and we have a lot of opportunities for them. So we're also looking at working with our different partners on reaching the lowest performing districts when it comes to those FAFSA CADA numbers that have historically been a little bit lower than some of the other schools. We're working on that. But the big piece I wanna highlight here is we saw a 256% increase in survey submissions when we were actually talking about the scholarships. So that $1,000 scholarship announcement, which started on January 26, since then, when we're looking at those data points from January through March, we actually saw that 256% increase in survey submissions since we actually integrated that part of, or the scholarship verbiage into, again, the marketing, the outreach, and those surveys, which is really, really cool because we were struggling for a bit on getting more of those survey submissions. So we now know that if we have funding, we're going to want to go ahead and still continue those scholarship efforts because we also saw an increase in some of our marketing analytics as well. So something to consider if you do have access to scholarships. We can go on to the next slide. So parent outreach. So a number of you actually already reached out um, and said in the chat that, you know, parents and families, there needs to be more communication to them. While I go through this, I would love to actually have you all in the chat just touch on some ways that you reach out to parents because we can definitely use some assistance and also learning about different opportunities to engage with them. But some of the things I wanted to highlight here is we really are leaning on our community-based partnerships when it comes to reaching parents. Um, so the Parent Institute for Quality Education, PIQUE, uh, definitely has been a critical partner in this. They're actually, I believe, presenting today if they didn't already present. But on parent outreach, we've worked with churches, Mexican consulates, different groups out there. Yeah, Pika has been mentioned in there as well. Um, we've also worked on developing marketing materials specifically for parents. So speaking direct, directly to them um, in messaging points like we can help your children qualify for financial aid or we're a resource um, and really speaking directly to them. So we even have a podcast episode dedicated to how we actually work with parents. Um, and how our student support line is also a phone line here at CSAC that can also help out parents, not just the students. So really, again, figuring out ways that we can directly work with the parents themselves. Um, going on new segments has been really big for us. So we're wanting to expand you know, beyond just the Univision Telemundo. We've done a lot of that Spanish outreach, but going back to what I mentioned earlier around the inclusion in languages, we want to also expand beyond you know, the traditional English Spanish networks and see what other spaces we can be invited into. But new segments have been really great for us in terms of jumping on for on-air interviews. We get asked to do those a lot. And so being able to speak to the parents that are oftentimes watching the news, sometimes it's at 5.30 in the morning, but we know that you know a lot of those parents are up, they're getting ready for work. And so we jump on those chances to go ahead and reach them. And then, as I mentioned, tailored social media content, educational toolkits. As we go into the fall and prepare for AB 469, something that I want you all to be aware of, if you haven't already heard this, is that we're building out toolkits. So these toolkits for parents, for students, for our partners, so that this requirement is as clear as possible, but also so that you get a better understanding of the financial aid process. So parents will also have more communication coming their way coming into the fall. If we go on to the next slide. All right, so I talked about this, postcards and texting. So at the left, so the left image, which you see with the mortarboard, that is a postcard or an example of the postcard that we sent out. So this year, we wanted to see if print media and postcards would still be successful in our marketing effort, uh, efforts. And the good news is that it actually really, really was. So leading up to the March 2nd deadline, uh, we were wanting to go ahead and address like, okay, if their students still haven't applied, what can we do? And so we're looking at communications. We still had a lot of social media. We still had many different ways that we were reaching out. And then March 2nd passed, and then an extension was granted. So April 1st became the new deadline. So what we actually did is we sent out postcards right around late March to actually speak to the April 1st extension. This postcard was the one for March 2nd, but we also sent one out leading up to the extension. And that was sent out to over 200,000 students. And what we did this time around, you saw the QR code at the bottom left of this image. That QR code was actually tied to the texting platform. We literally just launched this texting platform a little bit ago, um, about two or three months ago. 
So we're still very much in that pilot run mode, but we're trying to see all these students actually opt in. We had about 700 students prior to the postcards being sent in our opt-in system. Literally within a week and a half, we we're at over 3,000 students that actually had opted in for the texting update. So what we did is we started to message them about, hey, your application deadline is coming up. There's, you know, this is something that you still need to do. Have you checked in on, you know, GPA, all of those different things. We're sending them some quick messages. And the good news is that day by day, those numbers still continue to climb on the texting platform, which means that the students not only receive their postcards, but they acted on it. They you literally took a picture of that QR code and it automatically sent a text message to go ahead and actually have them subscribe. And then they could choose if they wanted to continue to opt in. But that's a really great example. Whenever we send out postcards, they tend to be successful and we track the analytics of the QR codes. Um, we're currently using simple text. I did just see that, uh, that question there. And right now we're using the simple text platform and it's worked out pretty well. Um, in the future, I'm not sure if that's what we're going to continue to use as this is more of a pilot run, but so far that worked. You're able to go ahead and create keywords, uh, track all the analytics. It has some really good, um, just a day by day numbers for you to go ahead and understand. So if that is something that you all are looking into or your schools, your organizations, texting has really been successful. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, Michael, really quick, I had a, or someone had a question. Yeah, absolutely. How did you choose the 200,000 students that you sent this? Yeah, to? great question. So what we did is we actually looked at our entire student population. And for this pilot run, we decided to actually do segmented groups. What that means is that we looked at students that had not filled out their application. So FAFSA, um, California Dream Act applications. These were seniors, by the way, so high school seniors. We also looked at students where their applications had been submitted, but their GPAs were still not on file. And so those need to be paired in order for those applications to be fully completed. So we also reached out to them. And then for renewal students, so for students that still needed to go ahead and actually renew their application, so they had already applied, um, those students also got a postcard to go ahead and let them know that they could actually still renew their application. Um, we've unfortunately seen a decline when it comes to FAFSA CADA applications for renewal students. So students that were already in college, but maybe dropped out or they're taking a pause. So we, wanna, we wanted to also reach out to them in addition to those high school seniors. Um, I can tell you based off of the analytics that we saw more success with the high school seniors. However, we're trying to figure out what other campaigns we can run specifically for those renewal students that we may have lost during the pandemic. So another population, but that's how we ended up choosing. So hopefully that answered that question. Thank you very much. We'll move to the next one. Yeah, of course. All right, if we go on to the next slide, perfect. So just a couple of examples. Um, if you don't already follow us on social media, we're at CA Student Aid. So please take a chance during this session to go ahead and just follow us on our various platforms. We are on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we are on LinkedIn, we are on, uh, what are we on, TikTok. YouTube. So you name it, we're pretty much everywhere at this point. Um, and our brand consistency, as I mentioned, is really important, especially since we went through the rebrand. We seek to go ahead and put out content that is engaging, but speaks to various audiences. So not just our students. You can see at the top right, you know, it says we're here to help. Um, and as a student and their family in that, we're really trying to be intentional about what it is that we put out um, and making sure that we also have representation across different groups. Um, and being very clear on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So we're continuing to refine those details. We're also always open to feedback from you all because we're not perfect and we definitely wanna work with you all. So tag us in things too, because we're happy to go ahead and share out um, different resources, different things that are out there in the community. Let us know. So we are always also open to collaborations. We've been invited to do Instagram Lives. Immigrants Rising is an organization that consistently brings us on to talk about the California Dream Act application. So you can also always invite our team and we're happy to go ahead and jump on different opportunities, whether it be in person or um, via social media. There's so many different ways to communicate now in this digital era, but wanted to give you a, just a quick example of some of the images we've been using. But to jump onto social media, because I really want to spend you know, some time on this, if we go on to the next slide, and then I'll open it up for questions after this section. So just some quick analytics, which is really exciting to share here. So you're looking at 2020 versus 2021 numbers for CSAC when it comes to our social media. And we're comparing October 2021, or I should say October 2020 through March 2021. So that last cycle, and then the cycle that just finished. So October 2021, 
through March 2022. So essentially, to put it simple, we're looking at 2020 data and 2021 data. So in 2020, we had about 6,338 followers across our platforms. We grew by 42% in the last year because we increased on our social media. We paid, uh, we did some paid advertisements. We definitely were doing a lot more collaborations. We were putting out a lot more content. Um, our posts, in terms of the organic posts, it wasn't tracking actually everything. So I will say that this, for example, the analytics weren't tracking like TikTok and some of the other platforms that we joined recently, um, which is why it doesn't show a growth there. But if you include those, there actually was growth in terms of how much we were actually posting. Our video views, similar to what I just mentioned, it wasn't accounting for TikTok and YouTube where we actually have quite a bit of views because many of you utilize our training materials. A lot of students are now engaging with us on uh, TikTok, which we're also trying to build out because we know that with TikTok especially, that's where the students are at. Um, but it, TikTok changes literally day by day in terms of what's trending. And so for us as a state agency and a government agency, we're also trying to find the right tone because we can't be too casual, but we also don't want to be, you know, just only seen as a, as a government agency because then students won't necessarily be that interested or as interested, I should say. So we're trying to find that space and that's going to take us some time, but I promise you that we are going to get there. Um, but link clicks. So what we've done is we've created a link tree. Some of you have um, a space to go ahead and just house all of your important links. That's actually been really cool to track because in 2020, we had about 5,603 link clicks. 2021, we were doing a lot more of link in bio verbiage, especially on Instagram, where we actually linked our link tree that has all of our important links, our different programs. Um, and we went up to 19,400 link clicks, which is a 248% increase, which is really incredible to see. So what that means is that the students are actually reading all the way through the caption to then actually prompt them to go to the link in our bio um, within our social media platforms and then click on it. We would say register via link in the bio. We would say apply via link in bio because uh, Instagram unfortunately doesn't allow you to go ahead and have links in the caption. So we started to go ahead and revert to that and then track the analytics. And thankfully there was quite a bit of success there. So just some brief analytics. So if we go on to the next slide. So how are our impressions changing? So we saw, and this is again, comparing those same 2020 and 2021 into 2022 um, analytics. This is just Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So again, just those platforms that were being tracked. We did see a 123% increase with overall impression. So meaning that what we did is we were able to reach up to 5.35 million people. Um, didn't necessarily mean that they all engaged with our content, but they saw it pop up on their screens. They saw something from CSAC. And so that was definitely up. Surprisingly, Facebook actually still tends to be really, really successful for us. I know a lot of people are like, oh, that's you know going into the stone age at this point. But you know, surprisingly, we actually still see quite a bit of success, which is why we still continue to pour efforts into there. Instagram is also really, really big for us. We use it to communicate quite a bit and students tend to send us their direct messages through Instagram. Now we're looking at what TikTok looks like because of course we know that the students are flocking to there. So we really need to get our TikTok game um, up and going. And that is in development. We're actually in the process of developing a social media committee in-house to be looking at all of those metrics and how we can go ahead and improve upon our platforms. But just to go ahead and summarize, social media works. Please use social media. If you're not already using social media, or if you wanna go ahead and touch base with us on how you know we can discuss, and we're happy to share out social media toolkits, images with you all. You don't even have to necessarily create all the material. We can create it for you in that sense as well. So if we go on to the next slide. All right, so, oh yes. So before we end off, um, one of the last things I did wanna to touch on, and then I'll open it up for Q&A, Podcasts. So I know that podcasts, especially during the pandemic, really gained even more popularity. So we're really excited because we actually created a podcast this past year. We interviewed a variety of different folks, um, high school counselor. We emailed folks from the Cal Soap, Cash for College Arena, folks that work with undocumented students. We, I think the last episode that we recorded was um, with people, a community-based organization that actually works with Foster Youth. So we're trying to theme out these episodes and really speak, speak to our audience and really let them know that we're also looking at these specialized populations that we're not creating content that's just you know a cookie cutter approach. We're really, really wanting to make sure that folks know that when they hear about CSAC, they understand that we are a resource when it comes to financial aid, but that we're also doing it through an equitable framework, meaning that we're not 
creating content that we just feel like is going to just work for everyone because that's simply just not the case. And we're really looking at how we can reach people beyond even just the student population. And I'll close it here before I open it for Q&A. Please know that you all are an amazing resource to us. And so although we're CSAC, yes, we're the statewide financial aid experts, we could not be where we're at without the work that you all do. And it's gonna be that much more important going into the fall that we work even closer together. So please engage with us. Let us know if you have questions. Um, at the very end, I think this next slide, Cherry, it has our outreach and marketing um, email. So please feel free to email us if you have any questions, you want to collaborate, you want to give us feedback, any of that. Please go ahead and utilize that as a resource. All of our platforms are also there. So please go ahead. And yes, Cherry mentioned, tag us. If you're putting anything about the session or about the summit, definitely tag us um, and follow us because we're going to be putting out a lot of information. And leading up to the fall, we're going to have a lot more developed. And for folks that are just interested genuinely in this marketing outreach comms work, um, yes, I saw that uh, folks asking about LinkedIn. Please feel free to find me. I'm easily found, I like to say. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and follow me if you'd like. But definitely follow our accounts as well. Um, leading up to the fall, what we're also hoping to do is host another webinar specifically for this area. So marketing outreach communications. So we'll invite you all again to have more of a conversation about what our October 1st um, through March 2nd campaign will look like. And then also to provide you with updated information that you can share digitally. But also if you're wanting to print out things, we're also revamping that space. So a lot of work is being put into what our marketing and outreach will look like in the future. Um, but we always will welcome feedback. Now at this point, I have talked a lot, so I'm going to go ahead and pause. I'm going to open it up for questions and definitely let me know if you have anything that you want to bring up, but we have some time. So please feel free to unmute yourself or if you want to put it in the chat, um, I'm happy to go ahead and answer any questions. Um, Michael, we had a question earlier that I yeah. uh, skipped. Um, <clears throat> it says, could an LEA send out the postcards to their students? Um, Marianne, I don't know if you want to clarify if... Yeah asking if CSAC could send the uh, like send a, a batch to you and then you send out the postcards or make their own. And if we if we lost them, what I can say, okay, yes, oh, okay. I could provide them. Yeah, so what we would need to discuss and this this is an easy question that I can then pass on to our data team. Um, and to our legal team is just to make sure that if we need to go ahead and have any sort of MOU and agreement of like data sharing that we cover those bases. But um, what we can do is if you all want to go ahead and again, really take that email down, I would say, um, if you all are interested in any of those efforts, definitely let us know because really what I would do from there is talk to our data team and then our legal team to see, hey, do we need to have any sort of agreement with the school or LEA or community-based partnership? before we do any sort of data sharing. But um, yes, that's gonna be, and yeah, and those text reminders. So real quick on that, um, as we go into the fall, what we're hoping to do is work with you all on sharing those QR codes with your students so that they can literally, if they're in class or they're meeting with you, maybe there's a poster in your office, they can go ahead and opt in by choice. Um, and so we're gonna be putting out more material that looks like this, but sending that to you all so that you can go ahead and actually have students opt in. Um, so that is definitely something that they can do. Thank you, Terry, for sending that. Um, but yes, those QR codes are really successful and we're happy to go ahead and collaborate with you all on that piece as well. All right. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of them says, did you say earlier that when students scan QR codes, they'd automatically receive a text? Yeah. Yeah, so what we were able to do, and I, I will fully admit that I wasn't the tech person on this. Um, I just helped to oversee the, the marketing component of it, but um, our IT person was able to essentially program the QR code to basically the moment that they take a picture and it asks them if they want to click on the little link that populates, it sends the message for them. And then they have the decision whether or not they want to stay opted in because they can press, they can um, text and stop to go ahead and be opted out, for example. Um, but even that could be programmed. Usually QR codes go to a link, right? That's probably what most people are familiar with, even when they're, you know, we're dining in restaurants during the pandemic or things like that. Um, but now you can actually even go ahead and have the QR code populate a text message. So it's that much easier. Um, 
I did see another question on postcards be ready. We're hoping that uh, the majority of our material will actually be ready by that October 1st launch. So we're definitely gonna be coordinating, letting you all know as well. Um, so definitely we'll keep you posted. A lot of that material is gonna be made later on um, in the spring going into the summer. Um, and a lot more funding is gonna be used for that space. So we're, we're gonna continue to let you all know where we land on that. I did see another question earlier. It was on, um, I think it was on uh, campus so, outreach. Yes. Yeah, so it says, do you have marketing ideas for on-campus outreach efforts? Yeah, some of the Cal Soaps actually, there may be some here, do some really wonderful work. Um, flyers, I've seen lots of different flyers being used on the hallways and offices. Um, I definitely have also seen when there's any sort of on-campus events, you know, when you have your um, your tabling, that's been really successful. Um, but you know what, Cherry, you all over at Riverside, and I know there may be other, some, some other CalSoap representatives, um, if you all want to share some of the things that you all have been doing. I think Sandra, I see you. Uh, would love to hear actually from the CalSoaps, because they, they do some really great job um, at doing on-campus stuff. So yeah, that's actually, um, so we hire salt college success coaches that go to work at our high school. So um, interesting thing, we just went to Highlander Day where um, admitted freshmen who were accepted to UCR and could, are possibly serving. And we have, um, we have easy ups with our branding. We have flyers with our, what services we offer um, and all of those. And we're gonna be doing summer centers um, and that we're sending those to all of our students. But we do do everything that was noted in the social media media um, that Michael explained. And so far, we've gotten a really good uh, feedback with our kids. We're just working on um, more feedback with our parents and reaching them. Thank you. And I see a couple. I was actually just looking through a list. There's some more CalSoap folks here. So feel free to chime in because the CalSoap program is definitely one that we work directly with and just do some really, really amazing work. Not to put you all on the spot. <laughs> I see some folks. Canva. Yep. Hi, this is Elizabeth. Um, I'm the administrative coordinator from the San Jose Council working with UC Santa Cruz. Um, a lot of the social media uh, uh, advice that you've been giving in this presentation, we utilize as well um, using the link tree, using Instagram, Facebook, um, newsletters. I think that we have seen a significant jump in our own social media reach with our uh, partner high schools as well. So I definitely recommend um, a lot of the tips that you've given. Um, one, one event that we had recently was our Spring Higher Ed Week, which is another sort of event that I would encourage um, many of the partners on this call to sort of maybe integrate into your um, programming, which is where we invited college representatives from across the state um, some representatives from out of state uh, just to come to our partner high schools. And basically it was a week long tabling event and it was extremely successful because we uh, reached out to a lot of partners who um, have maybe never done tabling before. And there was a huge diversity in the type of events. I mean, we had um, representatives from barber schools. We had representatives from um, military institutions. It was just a really great diverse pool of people and it was immensely successful and it really gave a lot of um, help to the outreach. And we do have a higher ed week again in the fall, um, October 18th through 21st. If anyone is interested, uh, you can reach out to San Jose Calso. Um, but these types of events we find are really impactful in extending our outreach and extending the outreach of a lot of people who uh, get involved in it as well. Thank you so much for that. And that, yeah, absolutely. Just trying different things. You know, sometimes for us, it's just trying a pilot run and seeing if it works. Um, sometimes it's not going to be as successful as other campaigns, but we learn from each of those experiences. But definitely, and again, shout out to the Cal Soaps who are doing some really amazing work out there. Um, I did see a question. And then after that, I know that we're going to be transitioning to the end of the summit, believe it or not. Um, but I see this in the chat. So needing to find kind of the, the, it looks like the balance. So I'll read out the question, but it says we're a little limited in our advertising as we're housed in the Department of Ed and have to juggle their brand standards or CSEC. Any advice for this balance from anyone? So I'll just quickly touch on that. Um, sometimes we'll work with organizations that, of course, have their own branding similar to us. We're happy to also go ahead and discuss, you know, finding kind of like a middle ground in there where we can go ahead and create something together or if your organizations are comfortable, you know, knowing that it is CSAC that's putting out some of this material, 
we have a lot of material that's made, so we can share that out with you all down to literally sample captions that you can use on social media. And if your organizations feel comfortable enough and at least sharing out our material, I know that it may not be, of course, your brand style, but if they feel comfortable with knowing that we're a reputable organization and you can share out that information, that's fine. But otherwise, you know, we work with organizations where sometimes we're doing a joint event and we need to go ahead and use multiple logos, multiple colors, you know, as long as it doesn't, um, you know, impact our brand very much as well, like we can find that middle space and we've been able to do that in the past. And that's a great thing to bring up because sometimes you all have organizations that are also like not wanting to steer away from your brand, which makes sense because we don't want to do that either, but we can meet in the middle and we can have those conversations. And Michael, there was a question earlier. Mm -hmm. Is there a digital toolkit or materials that can be personalized and then used on our yeah. Yeah, so CSAC now has a social media toolkit hub. Um, and basically what that looks like, let me see if I can actually find it real quick. So we have toolkits that are developed, including for one of our new programs, the Golden State Teacher Grant Program. So the toolkit, I'm gonna pull this up here. We'll have more new ones because right now some of these are now outdated because March 2nd obviously passed, our extension passed, things like that. But um, we have a toolkit hub. So please feel free to go ahead and engage with that. I just put that in the chat. We're basically going to continue to make toolkits for different programs. So most recently, we created one for GSTG, which is the Golden State Teacher Grant Program. We're going to create ones for different programs that we get. But every time we have a large marketing campaign, we're basically going to want to create a social media toolkit. If any of you are wondering what the heck is a social media toolkit, click on each of them. Essentially, what you can do is you can literally download images from our website, and then you can copy and paste captions. Sometimes there's videos, sometimes there's flyers. Basically, what we wanted to do is just make it super easy for you all to go to one place. And if you're like, we don't have the resources to create our own things, or maybe you all don't have a marketing department, maybe you don't have funding for some of those things, to make it as easy as possible where you can just download everything, copy and paste, and post it on our behalf, um, because it's still reaching the same students, and it's still a very much a partnership, and we want to make it as easy as possible for you all. Okay, and Michael, sorry, one last question. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm self-professed not great at social media. I just <laughs> no um, uh, a question, how often do you do media blitzes um, to get the most engagement with kids without being overwhelming? That's a great question. Um, honestly, we post probably, I would say, three-ish, three to five times. I mean, depending on, like, if we're leading up to March 2nd, of course, we're wanting to post probably every day leading up, but um, I would say we generally post because we have a lot of different programs outside of just the Cal Grant program, um, three to five times. That may seem like a lot for folks that don't necessarily engage with social media. If you can at least post once a week, just so that students know that you're an active uh, platform, because sometimes what will happen, unfortunately, at this point in this digital space is that if folks see that you haven't posted in a while, they might just unfollow you. Um, it's kind of just the game that we're playing now. Um, so if you can at least post once a week, you know, even at least once every two weeks, you know, there's at least something, there's some sort of consistency. But this is why those toolkits are so important, because we've heard from organizations that are like, we don't really use social media much, or we don't know how. For folks like that, I would definitely say really, especially you all engage with the social media toolkits, because you can literally just download our stuff and then just post it. Um, and that's completely fine as well. Um, but there's also some really good resources. If you all ever want to, you know, check out some YouTube videos or just free resources, because I know not everyone has funding to do all this professional development for like marketing things. Um, there's a lot of really great resources um, and brands that you can follow online that also just teach you some tips and tricks. But we, as a resource, um, our unit can definitely assist you in that too. Perfect. And that looks like all of the questions. So at this time, I just wanted to thank you, Michael, so much for sharing your expertise with all of our participants this morning. Thank you for everyone in the chat for your contributions. I see you guys sharing emails. Um, please know that all the presentation materials are or will be available on the SCED event platform. I know some of you are having trouble uh, downloading the PowerPoint, so I will go ahead and re-upload that. Otherwise, you can always email me to ccunningham at rcle.us. And I I would be happy to send you the PowerPoint directly. Um, the recording will be posted on the CSAC event webpage. Um, we also welcome you to use SCED to provide feedback so that we can continue to provide you with the support you need to implement. Um, at this time, we would like to ask that you join us for closing remarks with our president, Marlene Garcia, starting at 1155. And thank you again so much for attending the third annual California College Affordability Summit. Hopefully we will see you in person next year. Thank Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.